think we're good. Um, audio is super low. Let me put the audio up. Audio should be pretty good right now. All right. So for those folks joining online, uh, apologies for the late start. We're starting roughly 15 minutes late. And as I told the people that are here in person, I did an OS upgrade today. And it, I tested it before class and everything worked. But then when I restarted, what it did is it deleted all my permissions for all my software and had, I had to check through them all one at a time, put a password in each time. So I think we're good now. So this should, should work out okay. Thankfully, at least, we don't actually have a crazy amount of material we have to cover today in today's class. We just have kind of the tail end of the water chapter, and I wanted to finish that one off before we um, begin the next unit, which is going to be on cannabis, which we will start, today's Tuesday, we'll start that Thursday. Um, so in all likelihood, today's class will be uh, not super long, which hopefully you can uh, be okay with. It's a nice sunny day at least. You can spend some time outside. Um, so we, this unit so far, we've been talking a lot about water and issues around water. We talked about the chemistry of water. We talked about, you know, how water gets to your home, how it's treated along the way. We also talked about um, various methods of purifying water besides what happens in the municipal process. We looked at distillation, reverse osmosis, uh, ozonation, a whole bunch of different things. And the last piece that we're going to be looking at is issues around bottled water versus tap water or any other source of drinking water that you might imagine. And the pictures that I have on this slide are taken in the uh, Student Union Building here at Acadia. And this was an organization, a group, a student group about 10 years ago. Um, that as far as I know, I haven't heard anything from this group since. I don't think they're still active. But they had a real campaign going about 10 years ago in the student union uh, to promote tap water and to discourage con consumption of bottled water. And the reason here was um, the reason here was mostly for uh, environmental reasons, not for health reasons or anything around those those. Uh, uh, anything along those lines. Still, my computer is popping up little messages, software looking for permission to access various things. So, sorry if I'm a bit distracted by that. Uh, okay, so, so around this time, <clears throat> one of the issues was that, you know, a lot of the older buildings here on campus had water fountains, drinking fountains, where you could just fill a water bottle, I guess, or just drink straight out of the fountain if you wanted. Uh, and they kind of slowly over the years, maybe starting in the 80s uh, into the 90s, started to be decommissioned. You know, if one was uh, needed to be replaced, rather than replace it, they would just take it out. And what was kind of replacing it was vending machines that would sell bottled water. And there's two issues around that. One is bottled water is um, ha has environmental costs associated with it that we'll talk about. And the other one is that it costs money, where the other form of water was free. And I would say this campaign was very largely successful at Acadia. Uh, I know that many new water fountains, and they're kind of fancy now, they have like the, the water is filtered using all the filtration methods we talked about already in the course. And often there's water like bottle filling functions and this kind of stuff. I know there's several in the athletics complex. Uh, I know our new our chemistry building has one in it after our new renovations. But at this time, this is around the time I think the new biology building opened and brand new building. And it was like, I think it was the first building in Nova Scotia that met a certain environmental standard. Yet it had no drinking fountains in the entire building, four floors or whatever the building is. Um, so this is, that's since been remedied. I believe there is now, although I don't spend much time in the bio building. If there's bio students here. Maybe you can correct me. So bottled water. You know, if you look at this graph, bottled water wasn't really a thing 50 years ago. And, and 50 years ago sounds like a long time ago. When I was a kid in like the 80s and 90s, um, you know, it's, it's the early part of this graph. I remember being a small kid and being in a store and seeing bottled water in the cooler with pop and all these other things. And I, 
It was the first time I had seen it as a commodity you could buy. And I remember being shocked by it that someone would spend money to get water when pop was right next to it. <laughs> and of course, the pop is what I would have wanted. Uh, but you can see it's definitely a, a relatively new phenomenon of people drinking um, water that's produced this way. And this is in terms of gallons per person per year. And you see my data stops at 2012, so it's a little bit old, but uh, you can kind of see where you're at. 30 gallons per person per year. Um, and a gallon is about four liters. So what's that, 30, 120? That's like a, one bottle of water a day, like 350 mils a day or so, roughly. So where does bottled water come from? Um, it's often advertised, you know, with as being this fresh mountain spring, pure whatever water. Uh, but most bottled water actually comes from municipal sources, meaning it's treated water that comes out of the tap the same way, going through all those same processes that we talked about in the course, like flocculation and chlorination and blah, 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 blah. And this is Dasani, which is Coke. And it says to create Dasani, Coca-Cola bottlers start with the local water supply which is then filtered for purity using a state-of-the-art process called reverse osmosis, which we know all about now. Uh, then the purified water is then enhanced with a special blend of minerals for a pure, crisp, fresh taste. So the water basically is purified by reverse osmosis, and then they add a proprietary blend of, you know, salt water-soluble salts and minerals and things like that to give it uh, a very defined, I guess, taste. And you might think water doesn't have a taste, but there actually are noticeable differences between different brands. I don't know if, if, like, if you gave me a bottle of water and I drank it, I don't know if I could tell you what the brand was, but there may be people who could. I don't know. I have a friend went to grad school with, and when he was a kid, he was kind of addicted to uh, Coke. And he used to drink, he said, between like six and eight cans a day. And he said he could tell the difference between batches because apparently on a can, it'll have like a batch number, which tells you the batch that it was brewed in, so that if there was ever an issue, they could find quickly the whole batch. And he said, like, if you gave him a drink blindfolded from two different batches of Coke or two, two from the same, he could tell you whether they're the, from the same batch or not. So some people have a very keen sense of taste, which I certainly don't have. I don't know if I could tell the difference between Pepsi and Coke when it comes to something like that. Uh, maybe if they're side by side, I could. I don't know. I couldn't tell you which was which, but I could tell you that they're different. Um, so yeah, that's where, where this bottled water comes from. And the main environmental issue around this is that it's in a bottle. It's in a plastic bottle, and plastic bottles ha create a huge amount of waste. In 2017, there were 50 billion bottles of water that were purchased in the U.S. Roughly 10% of those bottles got recycled. So the remaining 90% it becomes garbage. And that garbage either goes to fill up landfills or it ends up in the environment, which is a double issue, right? And this is all waste, which is not associated at all if you drink water from the tap, because you obviously don't use a bottle. So lots of campaigns, public awareness campaigns around bottled water and how we shouldn't be using bottled water because of this plastics issue. Uh, this was a campaign, you can see these two people, um, basically are, the idea here is they have oil coming out of their mouth, that if you're drinking bottled water, you're effectively drinking oil because oil is used to produce the plastic that they're stored in. It's also used to ship that water, sometimes over great distances. So by basically consuming bottled water, you're becoming an oil consumer as well, which contributes, of course, as we know, to global warming. Uh, it's interesting if you look deeper into this ad campaign, though, this was an ad campaign that was sponsored by Brita. So again, of course, Brita has a motive here to scare you away from bottled water. They want you to use Brita filters, which has their own environmental problems because they're also not recyclable, although arguably it's way less of an environmental impact to use one Brita filter every three months than to use one water bottle every single day. Besides the fact that you also have to ship water some distance. 
So yeah, what's the solution to that? Of course, drink from a water fountain or drink from some other source. Which is kind of funny now because right, right now with COVID going on, you know, I don't know if you can, like, has anyone been to the gym lately? Do they still have, I know the fountain in chemistry, you can't drink out of it now. Is, are the gym ones all shut down too? Yeah, I think they're shut down too. So when there's not a pandemic, use the fountain or use your own tap water, bring your own bottled water, whatever you need to do. So around 2000, uh, Nalgene brand water bottles became very popular. And I don't know if you've seen these, uh, they kind of like became ultra popular, like every single person had one and then they instantly became unpopular. And uh, I, I found this funny at the time. I was just beginning graduate school at the time and Nalgene was a very popular brand for lab bottles and things like that that you'd use in the lab for reagents and all this sort of thing. So I associated Nalgene with like scientific research. Uh, and then all of a sudden they came out with this mass consumer product which became very popular and they're just plastic bottles, right? That you could fill up with water at home and carry around with you. Um, the reason that why they became very popular at the beginning is these bottles are extremely durable and you can take these bottles and if you dropped it on the ground, it's not going to break, it's not going to shatter very easily at all. Very, very tough, very resilient, last a very long time. The problem with them came with the chemical that they're made from. The particular kind of plastic that these bottles are made from is called polycarbonate, which is a type of plastic. and People were worried that this plastic could be leaching a chemical into the water called bisphenol A. So this is the plastic itself, and this is actually showing you uh, the structure of the plastic. There is um, basically what it is. This is kind of a, a chain of atoms that are all bonded together by covalent bonds, making this unit. And by having these kind of brackets here and here, with N, what that means is that unit is repeated in a chain again and again and again. And how long is the chain? Well, we don't know. It's N units long. And N could be hundreds, N could be thousands. So you can think of this as, as sort of a super long, skinny, stringy molecule. And you can have many of these long strings together, and those long strings together will pack and they'll turn into a, a very tough, rigid plastic material. And all plastics, more or less, have that same structure, these very, very long, hundreds or thousands or millions of units long uh, chains that are all stuck together. So this is made by adding two pieces together. There's this piece, which is made from a molecule called bisphenol A. And then this piece, which comes from a molecule called phosgene which is a funny name for it because phosgene kind of suggests there's phosphorus in it, but there's not. It's just unrelated, still called. Uh, so the idea is you take these two chemicals and you mix them together and they kind of form this repeating pattern, AB, 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 AB in these long chains. And then when the reaction's done, you have this hard plastic material you can use to make a bottle, uh, but you may have some molecules left over of your starting material that didn't react in the first place. The other thing that can happen is this plastic can potentially degrade back into those initial molecules of bisphenol A and phosgene. So this plastic polycarbonate, very common plastic, it's used for a lot of things besides uh, these water bottles. Uh, in fact, in 2006, 32% of the polycarbonate made was used for optical media, which is DVDs and CDs and Blu-ray discs. Uh, so that hard, rigid plastic, pretty durable plastic that those are made out of, basically that's the same material that was being used to make these bottles. Very tough, very cheap, and, and perfect for something like that. Um, so yeah, don't use optical media like DVDs as plates because it's not necessarily something, uh, it's used in electronics as well. I think, I feel like optical media has sort of kind of died as a product, certainly since 2006. 
I don't know. Has, does anyone buy a CD, CDs or Blu-rays? Like, it's been years and years and years since I've bought anything like that. So that 32% today, I'd be curious to see what that number is. Maybe like 2%. But anyway, it's used to make bottles. It's used to um, in construction. It's sometimes even used to line the inside of cans to protect the metal from the can from coming into contact with the food. So this is a book actually, it was written by um, Rick Smith and Bruce Laurie, who are, I believe are Canadians, called Slow Death by Rubber Ducky, where they're talking about certain chemicals that are found that are not really toxic and they're not really, um, you know, exposure to these isn't necessarily going to raise any alarms, but what they're worried about is the fact that these have become pervasive in our environment and that we're constantly exposed to small amounts. So it's not like you're going to get a toxic dose, but maybe there's cumulative effects over your lifetime that are very subtle and very difficult uh, to maybe measure and that maybe bisphenol has a problem like this. Anyway, it's an interesting book and they're the chemicals that are in the ducts that they're worried about are something called phthalates. By the way, this is a very interesting letter sequence, P-H-T-H. You see this in chemistry for, for certain things like uh, well, phthalates, phenylphthalein, certain words where you, there's like no other English words I know of that have that. But I think this comes from ancient Greek where like theta is the th and the ph is like what's phi phi theta so it's like a thing that you don't see often in the english language but you see it in words with greek roots if there's anybody here who's a etymology fan who likes not entomology that's the study of insects but study of words so bisphenol A has this particular structure right here. This would be what we would call a monomer. This was a single unit that you can put in strings to make plastics, to make polymers. Um, it turns out it's similar in shape and size to this molecule, estradiol. Estradiol is an estrogen compound. So when we say estrogen, estrogen is a chemical. It's a sex hormone. It's a steroidal compound. Um, in human beings and other species as well. But estrogen itself is actually not a single molecule. It's a family of, I think, three, at least three separate molecules, of which estradiol is one of them. And I believe why we just call it one thing, estrogen, is, is I think our body, if you're exposed to any one of the three, your body interconverts it from the different forms. Um, if you look at this molecule, it's actually very interesting. We learned in this chapter already that molecules with OH can hydrogen bond. If they're kind of like sticky little labels on a molecule which make them water soluble, makes them stick to other things with OHs and so on. So estradiol has an OH on one end and an OH on the other end. It kind of has these two sticky receptors which allow estrogen receptors in the body to detect when estrogen is present. Bisphenol A also has these two sticky handles, more or less the same distance spaced apart. And so bisphenol A can also fit into estrogen receptors in the body. And the receptors might be falsely tricked into thinking estrogen is there when it's not. In fact, it's bisphenol A. So what we might call a molecule like bisphenol A is an estrogen mimic. So an estrogen mimic is, is just a compound that can trick the body into thinking more estrogen is present than is actually present. Now it turns out bisphenol A does act as an estrogen mimic, but it's a very weak estrogen mimic, meaning um, actual estradiol will have like a hundred times bigger response, biological response, for a given dose than bisphenol A will. So it can elicit mild estrogen-like uh, responses in the body, but nowhere near as well as estrogen itself will. So it's kind of a very weak mimic in that sense. Nevertheless, it's a mimic, and hormones are definitely not something that you want to just be messing with willy-nilly, the levels of them in your body. 
Certain cancers, for example, uh, certain types of breast cancer can be accelerated by the by presence of estrogen. Uh, I don't know a lot about that, but I, I I know some types are sensitive to estrogen levels and sometimes aren't. Some types aren't. Uh, so yeah, you don't want to necessarily be messing with that. So there was some action against BPA when this when it first became clear in the mid 2000s that this type of plastic, this polycarbonate plastic, could potentially be leaching an estrogen mimic. And at that time, the evidence that this was actually happening was pretty weak. Okay, But out of an abundance of caution, several things took place. First, in 2008, Canada labeled this particular material as toxic and banned its use in baby bottles. The idea being that if you are a baby and you are exposed to an estrogen mimic, it could have much bigger implications for your health because you're undergoing development at the time than a fully developed adult human being would have. Um, in May 2009, the largest BPA producer in the U.S. stopped selling BPA to manufacturers of baby goods there. Six largest manufacturers stopped using BPA in baby, food, baby items is there as well. And... In that same year, the National Institute of Health, the NIH in the U.S., released 30 million uh, targeted in research grants to study the health effects of bisphenol A. So we would have a better idea of what this could mean. So kind of right away, there was this sort of cautionary approach taken to the amount of BB BPA that could potentially be leached into foods, into water, and so on. And amongst this abundance of caution... Everybody threw out their Nalgene bottles. Nalgene kind of scrambled. Like if you have a Nalgene bottle now and it was bought within the last decade, it'll probably say somewhere on it, BPA free. They still produced the bottles. They switched the plastic to one that cannot release BPA. Uh, so in that sense, you should be safer. Um, but if you have a super old one, I guess, I don't know. Uh, I think what really got people excited too was a report in February 2010 which indicated that occupational exposure to bisphenol A uh, was correlated with a high self-reported rate of male sexual dysfunction. Which I guess makes sense. If you have hormone levels or, or if high levels of, of hormone mimics and it's well known that hormone levels regulate sexual function in adults, um, People kind of connected the dots very quickly when this article came out to a lot of media attention that any product that you are using that could potentially leach bisphenol A could uh, impact your ability to perform sexually. So people didn't like to hear that. Um, it's important to notice I, or to note here that this is occupational exposure so that if you are working in a factory or plant which produces this you could potentially be exposed to much higher doses than you might be if you were drinking out of a water bottle, not getting occupational exposure to the same, same chemical. So what quickly replaced these Nalgene bottles was metal drinking bottles, um, which are typically made out of aluminum or stainless steel. They are more expensive, of course, uh, but they're more durable. You can't see inside them, which I guess is a negative, because if, they're, if there's anything floating in there, I guess you can't really tell, but I guess you can look in through the top. Um, the metal drinking bottles, some of them that were first on the market were no better. And the reason was is that the inside of the metal bottle was actually coated with bisphenol A, because it's actually very good as a watertight, um, as a watertight material. So what people were kind of trained to look for were water bottles, metallic water bottles that had this label, bisphenol A free, made of non-toxic plastic. Look, it also says phthalates, which we said was in rubber ducks, which we'll talk about in a future chapter. No bisphenol A. And this sort of became the norm. I feel like this became something the public became very aware of for about a year or two. And then it just became an assumption that any water bottle from now on would be BPA free. So I don't even know if people look for that anymore. It's something that I kind of remember it was very topical. I think when I, the first time I taught this in this course, now it's kind of like 
laundry detergent when it says phosphate free. That was a big deal for a short period of time. Everything switched and then now everyone has forgotten. Just like acid rain, just like ozone layer. All these issues that were huge issues in the public eye and then kind of got fixed and forgotten. And we're all crossing our fingers that climate change is one of those two. That in another 30 years, nobody talks about it anymore because it's fixed. Not because we're all dead. Hopefully that's not the reason why. Uh, by mid 2000 teens, I don't even know what we call these now. Uh, um, the research, of course, that was sponsored late 2000s was starting to roll in late 2000s. I don't even know. Like what? How do we? How are we supposed to call these decades? It was so much easier in the previous century, like 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Is it 2000s? Help me out here. Teens? Are we? Was it last decade? The 20 teens? I don't know. What did they call it last century? Because it was the 20s, and the, tw the 20s on is obvious, but then the teens and the decade before that. I have no idea. Anyway, by 2015, let's say, the results of all that targeted research on the health effects of bisphenol A was starting to come out. This is an important one. 2015 from the European Food Safety Authority, the EFSA. And basically what they did was investigate all of the research. Most people say 2010s. 2010s? That doesn't make sense. I don't like that. 20 teens? The 2010s. 20 teens sounds bad too, but anyway. Uh, anyway, this came out, this is what they said. The panel, uh, what, was, what CEF panel? Um, I think that's contact materials, enzymes, and flavorings. I guess processing aids, I don't know why that didn't end up in the name. The CEF panel concluded that there was no health concern for any age group from dietary exposure and low health concern from aggregated exposure. Uh, the CEF panel noted considerable uncertainty in the exposure estimates for non-dietary sources, while whilst the uncertainty around dietary estimates is relatively low. Basically, so what, what they're saying is a couple of things. They have a really good idea how much exposure people have to bisphenol A through their diets. Exposure from other sources, it's a total crapshoot. It depends on your lifestyle, what products you're exposed to, and so on and so on. They, they had a, a rough time estimating people's exposure through non-dietary sources. But they knew very well what those exposures were to bisphenol A because, due to this being in your food or in your cans or whatever. Not just whatever. If, if you eat at, at Res in, 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 uh, at Wheelock, I think the plates, you know the plastic, kind of very light plastic, you could fire that as hard as you could against the wall and it would just bounce off. Very, very tough and rigid and obviously they want that for a purpose, for a reason, so that they're not breaking dishes all the time. I think those are made out of that same polycarbonate. So I guess if you're eating off of one of those plates, that would be, is that dietary exposure or non-dietary exposure? Because it's, it's an exposure you get because of you eating, so I guess it's dietary. Same as, I, I suppose, is if you ate food out of a can that was lined in polycarbonate. Um, difference, to me at least, is the polycarbonate in the can is in contact with the food for weeks and months. And the polycarbonate that's in uh, on your plates, maybe like 10 minutes. So anyway, they say they, they know how much people's exposure is from the, their diet, less so from other sources. Uh, in terms of just the dietary exposure, though, there is no health concern. That nobody is getting enough through their diet, uh, getting more bisphenol A than is enough to cause negative health impacts. Yeah, if you work in a factory that produces it, maybe you're in a different boat. That would be non-dietary exposure. Okay. Health Canada says this as of 2020. They have assessed the potential health and environmental uh, risks of bisphenol A through a chemical risk assessment. They found, first of all, 
people's exposure levels are lower than they previously thought, which is good. The amount that people thought was leaching, and we we're all very worried about 10 years earlier, uh, turned out not to be as much of a deal. Um, most Canadians are exposed to very low levels of BPA that do not pose a health risk. Remember, risk is not the same thing as hazard. Hazard is impacts that that chemical could have a, on you at some theoretical type or amount of exposure. Where the actual risk is what's your real exposure and is that exposure level dangerous? BPA in food packaging is not a health risk to Canadians, including newborns and children. So if you have one of those old bottles, drink away. Everything's good. Uh, the last little bit that I wanted to talk about in this, in this unit was um, drinking water fads. And it's weird that how you drink your water is a fad, but it is, like everything else, I guess. Um, these are often very pseudoscientific fads, and a common one, I don't know how common this is, maybe, maybe you've seen this before, maybe you haven't, it's called alkaline water. The idea is you drink water that is, is alkaline, alkaline means it's the opposite of acidic. You can have water that's either acidic, like if you have soda water, it's a little bit acidic. Uh, you can have water that has some base added. And you see all these things, why drink alkaline water? Helps the shed toxins, liver tonic. I don't know what that even means to be a liver tonic, but there you go. It's got all these things. Uh, some of these are true, but water is will do the same thing. So it's, it's the water in the alkaline water, not the alkaline part. Um, you can see this one. This one ha says it's 8.8 .8 pH, greater than 8.8, .8, which means it's alkaline. Uh, anything greater than pH 7 it's considered to be an alkaline water source. You can get some that says it's 10, you can get some that says it's 11, whatever. Um, it turns out this is 100% unmitigated horseshit. That if you drink alkaline water, the second it touches one drop of stomach acid inside your body, it's instantly super strong acid water. Okay, so the amount of alkaline that's present in your water will have no impact at all in your body and will not, definitely not, counteract the extreme acidity that already exists inside your stomach where this water ends up. So this is all BS. Don't pay extra money for alkaline water. It doesn't do anything, even though there's all kinds of promises that are being made. They sell not only bottled water, but you can buy machines that make your water alkaline. If you're convinced that alkaline water does have health benefits, the easiest way to make your water alkaline at home for free, or almost free, is pour yourself a glass of water and put a pinch of baking soda in there. That will turn your water alkaline and you don't have to pay extra money or buy a fancy machine. Even then it's not going to do anything, but if you think it does, or maybe you like the taste, you know? If water is a little bit acidic, it makes the water taste kind of sour. So I actually like that in water. So if you take water and squeeze like a lime or a lemon into it, it kind of gives it kind of a bit of a sour taste, um, which I, I like. But if you, if you really dislike that and like it the other way, which kind of makes it more taste chalky, maybe is the word to use, um, you can put a bit of baking powder. Not baking powder, baking soda. There's a difference. Baking powder is a mixture of baking soda and typically, I believe, tartaric acid that react with each other to make carbon dioxide when you mix them. Baking soda, not powder. And baking soda has the structure NaHCO3. Sodium bicarbonate, it's also called. So this is claiming, is your body acidic? Many diseases thrive in an acidic environment. And they have this acidic equals poor health, alkaline equals good health. Um, this is a really bad misunderstanding of how body chemistry works, how our you know, biology functions. It is true that certain tissues can be more acidic than other tissues if they're in a diseased state. So an example is, is cancerous tissue. Cancer tissue 
uh, it's characterized by tissue that is rapidly undergoing cell division, there's rapid metabolism, and there's a higher than normal consumption of oxygen in cancerous tissue. As a result, there's a higher than normal production of carbon dioxide, and when you have high levels of carbon dioxide, that leads to uh, a more acidic environment. So it, it may be possible, but drinking alkaline water will have zero effect on the acid levels anywhere in your body except possibly the inside of your stomach. Okay? It can't aff affect the acidity of your blood. It can't affect the acidity of your tissues or anything like that. Except in really super extreme, like if you drank a bottle of like Drano, okay, <laughs> yeah, that's going to affect... I wouldn't consider that a healthy thing to do by any stretch, but yeah. And this is crap. Uh, alkaline doesn't equal good health. Your body actually, um, your body actually needs to be in a very narrow pH range for you to be alive. And you can have diseases where your blood is too acidic. It's called acidosis. You can have diseases where your blood is too basic. It's called alkalosis. And those can be the result of disease. Um, it's actually possible, I believe, to put yourself in alkalosis, which means too much alkaline in your blood, not enough acid, by hyperventilating. Because if you force yourself to breathe in and out really quickly, what you can do is artificially lower the levels of carbon dioxide in your blood, and that will change the pH of your blood, which I think can cause you to pass out. So you can hyperventilate, and then when your body restores normal breathing, your pH level goes back, I think. Not something you should do. It's not good for you. You shouldn't try it. Uh, if you generate more CO2, your blood becomes acidic. So if you were to run, you generate acid, which goes into your bloodstream, um, which is why your breathing rate increases. To bring more oxygen to the tissues that need them, but also to exhale the excess CO2 that your body is producing. Two functions there. So it turns out with water, any kind of water, um, this is what we call a titration curve, which if you've taken first year chem or high school chem probably, you may have done an acid-base titration. This is one of these things where you have a burette and you drop base in drip by drip by drip and then you get this like dramatic color change typically from uh, colorless to pink or something like that. And what happens with the pH is if you have a really basic solution, a lot of alkaline pH 14, and you start adding acid, so we're going to add acid in units of cubic centimeters, which is the same as a milliliter, you can add a lot, right? You can add a lot all the way up to this point, and the pH barely changes. When you get close to neutral, close to pH 7, one drop can basically take you from here to here take you from a pH of like 10 down to like a pH of 4. So this is what happens if you have alkaline water. What was the one for sale there? 8.8. .8. It touches one tiny drop of stomach acid and boom, it's down there. So whether that water started out at pH 10, pH 7, pH 5, whatever, as the second it touches your stomach acid, you're going to have a low pH water in there. So alkaline water can't work from a chemical perspective and we know from evidence that it has no health benefits as well so do not buy alkaline water it's not dangerous it's safe you know it's not going to hurt you but it's going to provide zero benefits compared to any other water that you could buy or drink great um, the other one and this is a dangerous fad and this is a newer one it's called raw water and this comes from the, the idea that uh, the, what we call the appeal to nature fallacy, that anything that's natural is good for us, anything that's artificial or processed is bad for us. Uh, the idea here is that we should be drinking water that has not been treated in any way at all. That if there's a river or a lake or a puddle or whatever, go get your water from there and drink it. We should not be using chlorine. We should not be using reverse osmosis, all these other processes that we know purifies water and makes it safe to drink. Uh, so it, it's kind of weird, this raw water trend, there's 
again to bring back some ideas from the alchemists. Remember we talked about the alchemists and they like to, you know, do a lot of purification. They try to do chemical reactions and cauldrons and all this sort of thing. And we said there was a really heavy ritualistic element to the to what they were doing, that they had to, you know, say the words, magic words and all this kind of stuff. Um, there's a ritualistic element to the raw water movement as well. Uh, in particular, you have to store your water in like specialized containers. They're just glass containers, but uh, they sell them specifically for this raw water movement. And they always kind of look like this. Like they look like a, a glass jug with like patterns on the glass. And I don't know if that's branding or if the idea is that the patterns do something. But I've seen multiple different companies that have variations of these water containers. And the idea is you put water in here completely untreated. So this is one such company, Live Spring Water. I carry water with me in glass everywhere I go, so it's important how it's transported. Like you wouldn't be putting it in a water bottle, in a plastic bottle or a metal bottle. It's gotta be in glass. You may think it's obsessive, but it's a big part of my self-care. I'm super sensitive to water, to the water I drink and what I put into my body. I only drink the wild Big Sur spring water from the land where I live. Been drinking it for 10 years. It's a part of who I am. For the past month, I've been drinking my water from this incredibly magical orb from live spring water. Glass bottle with patterns on it. Okay. Uh, it's revolutionized my water experience and I could not be more grateful. Thank you for blah, 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 blah. And this is an ad, right? So this is advertising, thinking like, wow, the person, you can't see your face, but she looks young and healthy, and she drinks water this specific way from this specific orb. Maybe I should go buy one of those orbs to drink my raw water from two, and I could live that lifestyle too. And, and not that anyone consciously goes through that pattern of thought, but if subconsciously it, it, you know, it's in your mind, and then you're out somewhere and you see one of these orbs, like, oh, maybe I'll pick up one of those, right? Like, that, that, that's sort of the the theory behind how this is supposed to work. Uh, by the way, with raw water, the dangers of raw water hopefully are self-evident. If there's anything alive in that water and you haven't purified the water, you could potentially subject yourself to waterborne disease. And I have no statistics on the number of people who use, who, who sort of follow this raw water trend that are exposing themselves in that way. Um, you can see here, a new Silicon Valley craze could make people sick. Obviously, yes. Drinking water that's raw is one of the main causes of infectious disease worldwide. It's something that we have kind of forgotten about. It's kind of like the same, it, it rings to me the same as the anti-vax movement, where it's, it's easy to be against vaccines or the concept of vaccines if you have absolutely no memory of what the diseases that were vaccinated against how they manifest themselves like if you grew up with polio and you saw kids die or you know develop uh, mobility issues or other issues um, or if you've seen mumps or measles wipe go through a town and kill people you're you have a completely different perspective on how important it is to get vaccinated. But if that's all forgotten, you know, it's easy, it's easy to forget. So same thing for us with water. We don't really remember or can't really conceive of a time where we couldn't just count on the water coming out of our taps or being in our bottles or wherever we get our water being safe. And there's this movement now back to the way things used to be before that happened. Please don't drink raw water either. Remember as a kid when your parents told you not to drink out of a puddle? Or was that just my parents? Little, little kid, like two or three. I, don't, I, I was like, I got to, I learned. Uh, yeah, that's why. Bisphenol A is a compound that has the potential to leach into drinking water from what type of plastic? Polycarbonate, polyethylene, Teflon, or PVC? The answer is polycarbonate plastic. Next question and last question. What recent drinking fad, drinking water fad, focuses on drinking water that has not been subjected to any artificial purification methods? So I guess rainwater, like that would probably be the safest source. 
you know, it would filter crap out of the air, but at least, I don't know, water from like a river or lake. Puddle seems worse than those, but I don't know. I guess like, anyway. Yeah, don't eat snow. That's another one. Although snow has got to be purer, right? Unless it's yellow, but hopefully that's up. The answer is raw water here. Uh, yeah, stay away from raw water. That's it. We're done this unit. Uh, by the way, this isn't a real sign that was put up. There was a town, I forget the details, but they had a, a fountain, just like a decorative fountain in the middle of the town. And the water in there wasn't treated, right? So like any water that's not treated, it could have dangerous levels of bacteria or whatever. They didn't want people swimming in there. It's not swimming water. Um, obviously drinking out of it or anything like that. But people will go in there all the time and splash around and put their kids in there. And the I think the town was probably worried about people getting sick. And they put up signs like this that said no swimming. And it totally didn't work. It's like the signs on the front lawn of Acadia that say like no sledding. And there's like 100 people there all sledding. Like those signs, I don't know. It's like, it's the same sort of thing. And what they found was very effective is putting this sign up. Water contains high levels of hydrogen. Keep out. Because hydrogen sounds chemical. And people were worried all of a sudden about the chemicals in the water, not realizing that water is H2O. So it's, I guess, 66% hydrogen based on number of atoms. It's way less than that. It's like, I don't know, 6% or so based on mass. But yeah, high levels of hydrogen in the H2O to so stay out of the water. And it was actually extremely effective, so they left it up. All right, so we're all done. We will pick up on Thursday's class. And in Thursday, the next unit that we're going to be looking at, cannabis, right? So yeah, this unit is now done. So that means the unit assignment slash unit quiz, whatever you want to call it. I've been calling them assignments because I, I, I think of them like assignments. But the actual item in acorn the tool in acorn i'm using to create them is called a quiz so i i kind of think of them as quizzes too but anyway it's going to be due one week from today uh at 220 like always if you've been here in class anyway you should already be done in fact maybe you could have googled ahead of time and have it had it done a while ago so yes wait it's tuesday yes it is tuesday so next tuesday this will be due Cannabis is a short unit, it usually takes one class. So we're actually moving pretty quick through the material. We have another couple of units that we have that we can put in. We have one on food, one on pesticides, a few other ones if we have time, but no hurry, no rush. Great. Thanks everyone. And again, thank you for your patience at the very beginning uh, with the delay that I had in te teaching because of my Update to Big Sur. Is that how you pronounce it? S-U-R, Big Sur. Yeah, it's like that water source where you can get raw water. You can get operating systems and raw water from there. Uh, great. See you, everyone.